This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Simone Batasagi. How are you doing, Simone? Very good, thank you. Thank you thank- so much, Alex. Very good. Thank you so much for for coming on the show. I worked I worked hard on that name pronunciation, so I I hope I did okay. Very good. You did very well. You did very well. Thank you for paying attention to it. <laughs> so thank you for coming on the show, my friend. I wanted you to come on the show because you have a book called The Director's Sixth Sense, and uh, I have the book here, and everybody should definitely uh, check it out. And we're going to talk all about your approach to directing, which I'm I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. When I, you know, when I was looking over the book, it was a very interesting approach on how you do things. So before we get into the meats and potatoes of the book, how did you get started in the business? Um, well, I always had a passion for uh, storytelling in general uh, since I was a kid, really. And uh, um, uh, for, for part of my life, uh, I went in a different direction. I didn't think that uh, uh, I didn't even, even understand it was actually a director or a screenwriter behind me. I was just watching them and being excited and uh, actually writing little stories when I was back in Italy. But then I, I got my MBA from University of Pisa. I got a business started and got married and uh, life was proceeding in a kind of normal direction. Uh, and um, And then slowly... The desire to do more creative work started to emerge, and uh, um, my wife, that is way smarter than me, uh, <laughs> for Christmas gave me a gift, and it was uh, a three months uh, attendance to a, a night class about filmmaking. And at the end of these three months, um, we were meeting every Wednesday night for three hours, and uh, at the end of that, uh, we would shoot a short. And uh, so for the first time in my life, I had the opportunity to say action. And uh, I still remember that night. I still remember the smell. I still remember everything about it because it was the moment that I, I thought, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. That moment of, of um, focus of everything, everybody around you working so hard to achieve a common result. And then that you know moment of shift between the real world that is us preparing and working with lights and always too many people in a smaller space. And then all of a sudden, when you say action, everybody just stop breathing. And the only thing that comes alive is actually the what you created, what the fantasy that you had until a few seconds before. And so that transition became kind of a, a, a ritual and a, something you know, of a sort of relig- religion element for me. And uh, I got hooked and I started to shoot more shorts and uh, uh, a few years later, I won actually a festival in Italy. It was called Milan International Film Festival. And that festival, that year, I was very lucky. The prize was actually a, the full tuition for the Los Angeles Film School. Oh, so the wow. one-year program yeah. at Los Angeles Film School. So they, they shipped me here in 2004. Uh, me and my wife we decided to do that, this adventure together. And uh, at the end of the 12 months, we were ready to go back to Italy when I got the first offer for the first job. And and now I'm we are still here. You're stuck there. You you yeah. haven't escaped yet. You haven't escaped yeah. from LA yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, we are, we are, now we are even American citizens. So we we need the full transition. <laughs> That's amazing. I I always like to refer to what we do as uh, the beautiful sickness, because it is yeah. it is it is exactly that. It is beautiful, but it is an absolute sickness. There's a compulsion yeah. that we have yeah. to continue to make movies and create and. There's no logic behind what we do, <laughs> like in, no, in the sense no. of like a normal human being would leave after a certain – like if you get beat up as much as you do in this process. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And, and you know, the, the issue is that you know, because it comes out of a, of a true passion, yeah. um, it doesn't die and you almost would be willing to pay to do it. And oh no! It, it, things out loud, but, <laughs> no, but that's, that's the sickness, the issue, right? It's, but that's yeah. the sickness. That's the thing. And you just you 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 would. It's like, uh, I, I you mean I get paid to do this? Like I still remember the first time I got a check for directing. I'm like, wait a minute, they, I would have done this for free. I have no problem doing this for free. Yeah, but we but don't that's need the, to say that out loud. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. And of course not. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm way past the days of I'll do it for free. 
Uh, <laughs> I've got a family to support. When you when you're twenty something and sleeping on a couch somewhere, uh, yeah. you yeah, could you, you could do it for free. But it is it is this kind of compulsion to continue to create. And I always tell people, once you get bitten by that bug, it never goes away ever. It, it can go dormant for decades, but it always shows its its ugly and beautiful head at the same <laughs> time. Now, was there a yeah. film? Was there a film that kind of lit your fire? Was there a movie that you saw that you just like, oh, wait a minute, I think I want to go down this road? It's something that kind of sparked the idea. Uh, a movie in particular, I mean, I, movies has always been kind of part of my life and they've been inspiring in, in different ways. Um, you know, the very first movie I ever saw was uh, Star Wars. Of course. And then I always say that that. You know, you have a little taste of that one, and it's a pretty good. <laughs> and then um, more influential for me were later on uh, uh, Dead Point Society, because oh. I was watching it exactly when I was in high school, and I wanted to create my Dead Point Society, and nobody would follow me. Uh, but the, <laughs> the idea was there. And then um, I'd say probably American Beauty came at the moment in life where uh, the feeling of, of a some sort of a crisis or, or thinking about, you know, what you really want to do in life was more um, uh, present. And, uh, and again, the, uh, the possibilities actually to have that op- opportunity that, that we, we had in 2004 to really change everything uh, is not easy to come. So uh, kind of, it, it came kind of at the same time. And uh, so the, the inspiration, it was from, from American beauty and, Later on, even from the Matrix, eventually. Oh, of course. Was actually to to think about who you, you know who you are and what you want to do, and that's what when many things started to spin around. And um, strange enough, one thing that I just remember that uh, when uh, Star Wars Episode One came out, uh, in my way to uh, deal with my creative side. It was actually on Saturday afternoon to play ro- ro- to to do role playing games, and uh, uh, I mean at that time I was already 28, 29, so usually you stop sooner. But I was keep doing that, and my Saturday afternoon was my ritual with with role playing games, and uh, we decided actually to put up a a little uh, play with costume and lightsaber and everything, and I choreographed the entire fight and. And the whole thing, and they, we presented the event on on a stage, and that's where I think I had the first taste of putting together a team and uh, have the sense of how collaboration and creativity can really bring something that is bigger than the sum of the single parts. And uh, exactly at that time is when my wife started to feel that I needed more to um, release my tension in some way, and when I went to the to that school, so. All those things that kind of happen at the same time. That's that's a great story. Now, let me ask you: How do you? What, I mean, what is the six senses, in your opinion, of directing? Well, uh, the the basic idea is that when we tell stories, uh, especially when we tell stories in film, we are telling stories about um, human experience, uh, and the basic of human experience is our life. Right. So I felt that. Um, I could compare the six senses to uh, a way to pay attention to things that are happening to you in your life that in a certain way will resonate and will help you later on while you're making your movie. Uh, in some ways, a very basic uh, way of thinking related to the fact that everybody can be a director if we pay attention to things in a certain way and we look at and feel things in a certain way. Uh, um, and of course, the easy one is you know when you when you watch something you, and you compare it with using the camera or, or uh, other elements uh, like uh, when you touch things, it's compared to production design, mm-hmm. and uh, there are a little more complicated things like uh, smell that is about bad performances, and and the final one that is the sixth sense that represents the vision of, of a director, and so analyzing and comparing the fact that when I was I was uh, studying directing and I was starting to think about the story I wanted to tell. Many stories were coming out, out of my personal experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, the more I was authentic and the more I was honest in what I wanted to tell, and it's the, the better I was working as a director and a storyteller. 
And that's how the whole idea of the book came up. Also at that time I started to, to teach and I realized that there were no books uh, about being a director. There were many how to, you know, how to do a breakdown of a script, uh, you know, how to mm -hmm. hire a writer or how to do blocking and this kind of thing. But there was, was nothing about how to be, how to live uh, and how to, you know, in some way pay attention to all the inputs that life is giving you in order to become a better director. Uh, and because there was no book about it, I wrote it. <laughs> right, right. I got you. Now, in your book, you actually uh, you had a great uh, a great chapter of how to smell a bad performance. <laughs> it is a great, yeah. great question because so many directors don't understand the difference between a good or bad performance. It's not something. It's hard to teach it. It's something that you have mm -hmm. to have instinctually. You can. Give cues, but I'd love to hear your definition of how to smell a bad performance in, a, in, in an actor. Well, again, it, it starts even before working with actors. It starts with uh, your research and your openness to um, look at how people behave. Uh, because after all, uh, especially in film, a different kind of in, in theater, where everything is kind of more fake in some way, mm -hmm. the projection of the voice right. and everything is much larger than life. But in in movies, we can be as sophisticated and as subtle as we want. And uh, um, you know, uh, having the opportunity to pay attention to how other people behave and also apply a strong empathy to how people uh, behave around you and how they react to things that you say or amongst each other, uh, it's a great source of uh, uh, inspiration because you you see around real life, and then when you apply this element to uh, to the acting, uh, for me, it's always getting to the honest level of the of the actor. Um, there is lots of layers of sophistication of training and other things that are uh, can help uh, getting to real emotion. But in the end, what we need to see is honesty and all those um, layers of uh, pr protection that we create on our, in our own life kind of being put aside in order to give something to the, to the audience. And uh, the process for me goes um, from uh, a very simple word, that is the trust. So uh, the ability to create a relationship with the actor in knowing that the actor is trusting the director to uh, always push to the limit to be honest about the performance and never short uh, cut because of, of other necessity. And on the other side, the, the trust of the director to the actors to know that they're going to push themselves and they're going to be willing to uh, open themselves up. Um, one of the processes that I, I follow a lot is, is to actually um, work with the actors before as much as we can in, in pre-production so that we can understand the character as much as we can but also there are two points that i try never to uh avoid or to break one is actually uh avoiding casting uh it's i try to have meetings at lunch or a coffee uh, i like to meet the person before meeting the uh character because usually when you do casting there's always that element of uh, of selling uh, yourself in some way <laughs> when you have lunch when you have lunch or dinner uh, all those barriers quickly they go down and you really meet more the real person or as, as real as you can and the second element is the fact that I uh, rely a lot on their instinct in terms of uh, of blocking and uh, owning the place so I have my shot list I have my blocking diagram I have everything ready uh, but I like the fact that once we get to the set, they must um, feel that it's there, that it's their environment to, to deal with. And uh, I take lots of time, uh, usually during the day, to make sure that that part comes as honest as possible. And uh, I have uh, my own recipe that is kind of a, a checklist for, for blocking, because through that process, uh, um, the actors start to lose the feeling of performing but they start to actually feel the environment, and the environment itself gives them uh, inputs and suggestions on what to do. So, uh, so in some way, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying most of the work is to try to 
eliminate the focus on the performance and on the lines and to more on the uh, living the moment and owning the moment. So that, that, that's a, that answer really covers, which was going to be my next question, how do you work with actors? But is there a technique you use or what is the thing that you, when you see a bad performance, like that's something that you, it's hard to, it's really hard to pinpoint. Like, right. is it, is it because it's stiff? Is it because it's not honest? Is it because it, you're not feeling it? What, is there any little cues that you can, any advice you could give to directors listening? Well, there are, there are elements that are uh, instinctive that you feel that there is something that is not working right. And that, that instinct is come with time and time mm -hmm. comes with also how much you know the character, how much you, you know well your world and how much you do your own researches. Uh, but I'd say that there is one element that I always pay attention to uh, that is uh, um, little, little uh, instinct in body language that actors sometimes have. Uh, you might see someone delivering a line and then uh, having a little moving forward or or on the side that would give a sense of oh that actor had an instinct to move to do something different or to uh, react in a certain way and uh, those little um, moments I pay lots of attention to them in blocking and during rehearsal because usually they mean that we are not done with the quality of the performance that we can get uh, because there is a, a level of uncertainty in owning the moment that we can keep exploring. And usually uh, the actors themselves that are giving me this sense of, oh, there is a moment that is stiff. There is a moment that, that doesn't really work because their body language itself in some way give away that there is something that is not working. So what I look for is a um, moment of uncertainty in body language, literally, literally the little gesture that doesn't work. And, uh, uh, what I do, I go to the actor that says, and listen, I noticed that when you said that line, I I felt that there is something more, that you wanted to do something instinctively, and maybe you didn't do it because I told you to stay there. So feel free to do it. And from that moment, usually, again, there is more trust, but also there is the understanding of an exploration. And the other thing that for me is really uh, an indication that we are, we are a little bit far away from the right performance is when there is too much staring in the eyes. When they keep looking at each other uh, for the entire dialogue, <laughs> that's where I feel that it's totally not authentic. They will never do something like that in life. And so I always try to give them uh, some activities or some business to do to make sure that these help them to not be stuck with, the, with this staring moment. That <laughs> I think that they're very unreal. No, that's that's excellent. That's a great that's a great 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 advice uh, on how to pick out some bad performances. Now, have you ever on the set? I mean, I've had this happen, and I've seen this happen. Uh, you know, I, it's all about trust with a with an actor. If the actor doesn't trust you, they can go off the reservation. Have you like on day one when an actor shows up been tested, like test you to <laughs> yeah. see, am I safe? A, a seasoned a seasoned actor. Depends on who it is. If it's like Meryl Streep, Meryl Streep could do it in any condition. She's like, I don't care. I'm Meryl Streep. I'll be fine. But but for other actors, they'll test the, the the director just to see if they're in a safe space. And that will determine how far they go in their performance. That will determine a lot of different things. And if they don't feel safe, they act up, they push, yeah. they create problems. There's other things. That, or, or they'll just not listen to you and do their own thing because like I got to protect myself. How is how have you dealt with that when that when it ha has happened to you in your in your career? Uh, well, to be honest, I, I had more more this kind of situation with uh, less known or less prepared actors yeah. than with uh, <laughs> professional actors. Uh, very well, you know, well known or professional actors. Um, the test actually happened before, happened almost outside the set at, the at set, dinner the at dinner. The card. At dinner, exactly. That's the moment where you really, you 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 feel it if they if you own them, if you if you try the trust is building up or not. And little hiccups on set, they are normal and they're part of the researches of, of what we do all the time. So that's uh, uh, usually with with very good actors, they uh, they eventually help you uh, if, if you are if you are in trouble uh, more than anything. I mean. I heard the legend of Marlon Brando 
testing oh. directors and other situations like that. But so far, to me, with, with those kind of actors, I never had any any issue, uh, and, and I work with some very good ones. So um, mostly with uh, with less known actor or less prepared, that they have actually the biggest issue is that they don't own their um, method yet, whatever that method is, uh, in terms of their, their approach to the material. And uh, um, sometimes their uh, uncertainty uh, built up on uh, a, a moment of, of mistakes, a moment of, of difficulty that happened on set. Um, and my solution is always very, very simple, is you know, taking five minutes and, and uh, uh, talking on the side and figuring out if there is something that actually the tension uh, has created. And I'm very honest. I mean, I remember one time I went and I said, listen, if you don't like me, I understand, but you need to to like your character. That actually was a villain, so it was even more complicated. Um, but you, you, you need to, it's going to be your face on the screen. So in not delivering or keep being distracted by the things that are happening on set. And actually, it was a, was a little bit of, of stiffness in the performance, but mostly it was attitude on set that was really preventing this actor to deliver. Um, and I think that in that moment of honesty where I explained exactly what I was feeling, and I didn't have any problem in saying, you know, we don't need to be friends. We, we need just to uh, deliver and agree on what to deliver. Everything went uh, started to go in the right direction. Um, one thing that I I try to avoid is to trick the actors into something that uh, the classic example of, of telling them, you know, I think that your character will feel better if it goes, you know, to open the door or lean backward or deliver that line with a specific performance, uh, because I think that. If there is a technical necessity for me because I need the next close-up done in a certain way, they understand better that, than me because they've been on more set than any other director that they work with, right? So just statistically. So when you when you tell them your necessity and you're honest about you, what you want to do, they should uh, react in the right way and, and help you in that way. When you try to trick them, uh, it depends. That's a, a, a difficult situation because sometimes you might actually lose their trust because they see that you're lying. Right. And, uh, someone said the actor is a lie detector, right? So as a lie detector, um, they can see through you very, very quickly if, if they do their job. Now, uh, with that said, uh, I know a lot of times when you're a young director or an inexperienced director and you walk onto set uh, for the first time, a seasoned crew will smell it yeah. in a <laughs> second. And yeah. how did you deal with, and have you ever had to deal with, you know, department heads, crew people, grips, DPs, production designers, <laughs> who t who test you and push you into like, oh, this kid doesn't know what he's doing. I'm going to do whatever I want. And you've got to take command of it, you know. And I, my famous story is I, I walked on a set of a, of a show that I was producing, and I was like the production company behind it. And I was literally writing the check to pay this guy. And he didn't know who I was. He just saw this this director, and he was like this frustrated first AD who wanted to be a director. You could tell he just was very frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hire him. And he started giving me crap day one. And within a few hours, I had to pull him aside and I said, "Look, man, um, I can do this without you. I've been doing this for twenty years. I don't need you here." <laughs> Me and my DP have been working for a long time together. We can run this set without you. So either get in line or you can leave. And oddly enough, he was very sweet after that. He was very nice. <laughs> and, and, and it worked out well. But though sometimes as a director, you want to keep a nice harmonious set, but sometimes you got to show a little teeth every once in a while. So what's your experience? Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, they were right in some way because I – uh, at the time, I was on this project that someone else started directing, uh, and uh, I was doing behind the scenes from uh, uh, for, for a production company uh, on several other projects. And at the same time, I was shooting shots uh, on the side. And um, I remember showing my uh, directing reel to the producer and say, hey, you know, when you have a project, then maybe you think I'm right. I would love to direct. I've, I've done you know, several shorts and I won several festivals. 
And he was like, yeah, yeah, we, we'll see. And um, and he he told me, listen, this could be it. This could be the project. I already have a director, but if something doesn't go the right way, I would like for you to, to direct this movie. And, I, and when the director said yes, he was going to do it, I told him, listen, give me a chance here. Uh, I will write three webisodes, the little stories um, to put on the DVD or to start a web series, whatever, um, based on the same character and in a different moment of their life. And uh, if you like them, then uh, we can, uh, you know, you can use them. But at the same time, I can start to stretch my legs as, as a director. There. And, you know, I can prove you that I can do it maybe for the next one. And, uh, of course, the, the whole situation started to be that I was uh, um, uh, involved in the whole production because I was scouting with them because I was going to do uh, the shooting in the same locations and, and using kind of the same uh, resources and so forth. And so I knew the, the project, I knew the script, I knew the, the actors from their casting, I knew the location, I did the whole preparation with them. And uh, when I uh, started, sh- when we, we, the project started, there were certain dates on which the main crew would shoot in a corner and I would be in another space nearby to shoot my little shots. And uh, um, what happened was that the production w- wasn't going very well. The, the producer wasn't very happy about the relationship and the style, uh, literally the visual style that the director was using. Uh, and then when I started to show him my material, uh, he liked it a lot. He was, you know, I liked the, the tone, he liked the style. Also, I overcome certain kind of very difficult situation and still delivered something usable. And uh, and the producers at one point said, "Listen, we we're not working with the other direct. The other director is not working. Uh, I want you today to direct." And I was like, "I cannot come to. I mean, this morning it's 7:30. I cannot be the director. I didn't prepare the scene. N- nothing." So I told him, "Listen, give me two weeks to regroup and and figure out what we are missing, what what is done, and because we are already like one week into production, so on a two and a half weeks." project, so it wasn't that it was much. Theoretically, almost more than half of the movie was shot. And uh, um, and so uh, he granted these two weeks. I I uh, started to work with the same DP, kind of same crew, but the only people that knew what was happening was me, the producer, the DP, and another uh, person that was a, a, a rental equipment uh, that, that uh, was on board with the project. They knew that I was going to be the new director, right. um, and then uh, the 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 day of, of the, the night before the first day of shooting, of my shooting, we regrouped in in Lancaster in the hotel, and uh, the whole crew was there. Nobody wanted to start the movie again because it was very miserable. What happened before? Nobody believed that the movie could go anywhere. Uh, even the actors, there, there were some friction and some issues, uh, mostly with the previous director. So when I was introduced to the crew, the crew was like, so now from, from his director, the director directed a few feature, we go to a director that actually was the behind the scene maker. What's going on here? So the very first day on set was uh, a trial by fire on, on any level because the crew was just waiting to, you know, to see me failing and uh, um, having no expectation. It was a very hot day. And nobody wanted to be there again because it was too hot. And, uh, you know, in, in the desert, in, like, in yeah, Lancaster, it can be quite brutal. Mm-hmm. And I remember that, that the, you know that. The, um, the change was because uh, the very first setup was a few uh, on, a, on a different location from the base camp. And we went there to do this setup. And uh, um, we did apparently something that the crew didn't do before. It was a Dutch angle. It was just a very kind of extreme simple. shot. Yeah. Simple, simple, but with a, a silhouette, the, the sun yeah. and the gun, something very strong for that kind of genre, right? That, that you can see in Mad Max and stuff. So apparently, I didn't know, this is a friend of mine told me later that um, while we were shooting, voice came back to base camp that actually this director maybe knew what he was doing because the style was totally different. The style was interesting. Mm-hmm. And we were doing some new action things that weren't even in the script and they were like very quick at what we were doing. And by the end of the day, 
it was the first day that actually we finished in the 12 hour. And uh, when we went back to the hotel, um, uh, pretty much everybody was waiting and they, they applauded uh, the re- returning together. And the dinner that we had was uh, a very jovial and happy moment for, for everybody. And from that moment on, kind of the crew was behind me 100%. And, uh, and I think that it was just by doing it and not trying to be arrogant about what I was doing. It, it was literally, I know it's difficult. Actually, I did something that I still remember. Uh, when I did it, I thought, this is going to be backfired so badly because they think that I'm just a rookie or I, I can get something out of this. So in the evening, when everybody was looking at each other and saying, you know, what's going on here? Why this guy is now the director? Uh, I stood up and I said, listen, uh, you know, I don't care what is your agenda with this movie. I don't know if you're here because you like the script or like the producer or you want the money or you want the experience. The only thing that I need from you is to make sure that tomorrow morning when you come to the set, you remember when you were in a, in a dark place called the theater and you were dreaming to do this. Come with that attitude and we're going to do miracles together. And Great. I didn't conquer everybody. I, I conquered a couple of people that were enough to to give me at least a, a, a little bit a of, chance. of a, chance. a chance in the morning and then throughout the day i kind of gain my uh you, my their trust do you know and I, I mean when i was starting out i mean i i had i literally had spies on the set to see if like <laughs> they were reporting back to the producer like i had a on one show i did uh or one one project i did i had the script the scripty she was oh. literally second guessing me every time well, why don't we do this i'm like girl you need to step back like i am the director here, and i was 26 or something like that i was a young director but i knew enough i'm like no i can do this and i and i ended up that day with like i think we ended up with like 75 setups uh i moved oh, really, I, I moved very quickly when i direct uh and and we moved really 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 quickly and at the end of the day she went back to the producer was like he's fine you, you, you'll <laughs> be okay. Back. He's okay. But these are the kind of things they don't talk about in film school. They don't talk about these things. No, these no. these are things. These are politics uh, of the real world inside of being a director. And you know, you just you can't read it in the textbook. Even it's like you've got to live it. But at least if you yeah. know that there's a potential of it coming, you can somewhat prepare yourself for it. But sometimes it was like I had spies. I had people that would, you know, I had DPs that wanted to take, you know, control. And that's why I became so yeah. educated in the, uh, in lenses and camera. And I come from post production, so I could, I have, I have a language in post production as an editor, as a colorist, as a post production supervisor, as a VFX supervisor. So I can just start you know talking. Well, yes. I know that. So I could start talking about lenses. And I could talk about this. I geek out about that kind of stuff, so that at least I can talk the language with the dp they talk, yeah at least we could talk i'm not saying i can do what you do because i've tried it i don't like it I, it is a whole other like thing to be a dp but at least you can show them that you know what you're doing and have basic understanding because there's some directors who who are like i had them in my edit room that would walk in they're like they don't know anything about the pro like they know nothing about the process they're like so what are you doing i'm like um this is a rough cut what is a rough mm-hmm. cut? I'm like, are you kidding me? You, someone gave you $3 million? What the hell is going on here? So, um, which made me a very angry and bitter filmmaker. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that uh, every time you, when you start, but also when you are in a, in a different kind of pond, when you move from one level of a budget to another, when Correct. you move from one city to another, uh, it happened to me something similar when I was, when I, I prepared a movie to shoot in LA and then, literally two weeks before start shooting, we had to move everything to New York, <laughs> and we couldn't bring, we couldn't bring anybody. So I had a new crew, I had uh, part of the new cast, uh, and um, especially the new crew. Although kind of we liked each other, but literally we we met in, two weeks before start shooting, and they all knew each other. So it was kind of them versus me in, in one way. Uh, and at that time, I, I had this conviction that, that I wanted to be a democratic director. I wanted to be the director that is always nice, there's always answer, that gives motivation whether it is a yes or no. 
and then backfire bad. Oh, they'll because, tear uh, you apart. Oh, you can't yeah, do they, that. This, this is this is a, this, I didn't have any idea of mine because I was listening too much. So I got to the point where at one point I I remember there was a a, a setup that was um, I had my idea and it was good, and then the DP came up with an idea it was good too. But I said no just for the sake of now I'm starting. I need to start to say no. Because otherwise it's going to go bad. And in the end, everybody was like, "Oh, you did the 180 from you know not knowing much to do a stellar job." At the end, I'm like, "Well, I kind of manipulated all of you because at the end we always did what I wanted." <laughs> but the the problem was that at the beginning, the the uh, feeling that there was this continuing testing was creating also, lo- also lots of anxiety on me, and. Uh, um, only when I started to realize that, after all, we didn't know each other. We, you know, the, the famous trust and the chemistry wasn't there because really we started from the, from a few days before, and then I started to work on the relationship also outside the set. The set, the set helped a lot to to move in to build actually a crew that worked together with me on on my vision. It sounded very much like an arranged marriage. Like you, know, it looked like you had you would like build a relationship with your LA crew, and you were like, okay, these are people yeah. I know. I have a relationship with them. I feel comfortable. But then you're like thrown into an arranged marriage. We're like, these are the people you're gonna shoot with. Like you're gonna live with these people now. It's like, wait, 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 yeah, wait, 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 wait. And then you've got to like, okay, I guess I gotta f- learn how to fall in love with them. Like I learn how to learn how to live with them because I don't know them. But, you know, at, at the end, that that happened. I mean, I I really love working with them. I think with with the considering the situation and other issues, but I think we did a terrific job and, and uh, the chemistry at the end was very strong. It was just a matter of let's start to trust each other and let's start to not second guess too much. But also that lesson, I think, went deeper for me because actually it was one of the things that I realized and I, and I tell my students uh, uh, all the time in terms of these uh, politics that is there, that you know there is a, a very fine line between being an arrogant director and being a good director. Uh, and the fact that you have your vision, your ideas, uh, and uh, you need you need to fight for them, doesn't mean that uh, you need to be blind in front of you know good suggestions or other things that are coming. And I think that the the, the way to see it that is most important is, after all, you are as a director, you are the only person on set that has a full vision of every component how they're going to work together. So you are the only true judge about this kind of close-up or this kind of shot work because of different elements. Uh, again, for music and again for wardrobe and all those things. Everybody else with all the good intent that they have, they come with a specific agenda in some way. They with a specific point of, of view of that course. is their professional point of view. So when a DP comes in and says, oh, this angle would be beautiful. Well, it's true. It's a beautiful angle. But maybe you want ugly for that moment of the story. And and only you know that ugly is what you're looking for, uh, you know. You share it with as much as you can, but you know you're the only final judge about it. And I think that when you look at the suggestion from this lens, from this perspective of saying, uh, I, I understand where they're coming from, and I need to judge them if they build up the world I want to build or not, is not arrogance anymore. It's just the fact that actually you are paid for the vision that you have, and the producer choose you or you put together the team because of that vision and everything that doesn't belong to that vision is not good or bad. It's just not right for the story. And in that way, I think that that's the best way to see it. It's not that you want to be stronger or show off or you want to shut down everybody else. The reality is that everybody can come with great ideas that could belong to the project or great ideas that they don't belong. Uh, and you're the only judge about it. You're the filter. You're the filter that has to yeah. filter all this stuff out. And you're absolutely. you're you're absolutely right because I mean I've had you know I've had DPs who've come on the set and by the way just as a as a disclaimer I love DPs I love what they do I, they they're an invaluable part many of my best friends are DPs but in in my in my directing career you've had DPs who come in and they're thinking about their demo reel like I can use this production okay. design I can use their budget to build my reel and it's not about the story. So they come in with a very egotistical sense of it. And that goes along with every aspect of the business from an actor to a, a production designer to, to, um, every, yeah. to stunts, 
Oh my God, stunt guys. I love stunt guys. Aren't stunt guys the craziest people I've ever... I've, I've never met a stunt person who I, I love them all. They're always tweaked because they're the only ones that go... Okay, I need you to jump off of that building off the second floor. And then this is what the stunt person will – I've never met a stunt person who doesn't say this. I could do the eighth floor. Can I do the eighth floor? I want to jump off the eighth floor. <laughs> and while I'm well, – and while, let me set my, can I set myself on fire and then do the eighth floor? But there's no need for fire in the scene. Can we write that into the scene? Can we put it – that's what they're looking for. They're always looking for that thing. They're insane, but I love them for it because without great stunt people, you can't make good movies and action movies. Also- they push you in direction that you didn't expect. Right. Also, right? Because we're scared because, because we're human beings. We're human yeah. beings and we have fears. So we're like, I'm not going to ask you to jump off the A floor on fire. I think the second floor will be fine. And they're like, no, 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 no. What we can do is then we can take the car and shoot it off the eighth floor. We'll spin the car around. <laughs> they're like, you, like, what is going on? They always push you. Good stunt people, good stunt coordinators always push you. Uh, in your storytelling, but it's it's something that <laughs> it, it's it's I've never met a stunt person who's not completely tweaked in one way, shape, or form, and I mean that with all the love in the world. <laughs> I agree. Now, um, can I you? And I, I mean, I worked on a movie that was about free running and parkour. Yeah. So those yeah. kids, they really want to jump from buildings. Yeah, they're just like, yeah, I could jump off that tenth story building. I'm like, what do you what? What there's yeah. just no there's no there's no wiring. I don't care. I'll do it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's youth. That's that's absolutely <laughs> youth. Now, um, are there any pitfalls that directors should always look out for? I think we've talked about a bunch of them, but are there any ones that stick to your head? They're like, you know, I wish someone would have told me this when I first started. Um. Yes, actually. Uh, <laughs> yes. There, 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 there are many, but I'd say that probably to start with one is uh, um, uh, to uh, understand everybody's role in in the production. Um, I I think that when you are uh, informed, and also if you have experience, even more. Um, uh, every position or as much as you can. Uh, first of all, the respect for every position grow because you realize how much actually they contribute with, for the for what they're doing to the to the project. And uh, uh, also you start to realize that you can speak that language as you were saying before with the DP about lenses and about camera movement or, or detail about uh, encoding. All these elements are making the conversation richer, deeper, and faster uh, just because you are able to understand their thoughts, where it's coming from and what they pay attention to. So definitely I, I'd say that one pitch for nowadays, especially you know, coming from now being also a teacher, that uh, lots of students, they want to jump into one thing, especially if they want to be directors, and they don't want to try, they, wanna, they don't want to spend their time doing something different. Mm-hmm. And that's something different can actually open up doors for them, like it happened for me doing the behind the scenes, but also gives you the sense of, of everybody's position and everybody's contribution to the project. So one suggestion is don't make the mistake of, of uh, this gigantic pitfall because actually you are going to carry on longer in your life because if you start uh, at the very beginning and you don't know much, but you're still able to fake it in some way, you keep going in a career kind of limping because you can never really take off as much as I think you can once actually you know what you're doing. Uh, I remember this was actually told, uh, a, a, an editor told me actually, uh, um, Danny Green, that is a famous editor, unfortunately passed away um, uh, a few years ago, uh, and that he was an editor. He was saying, you know, know how to build a camera, know how to, to change lenses, know how to clean them. Uh, know how to push a dolly. And uh, at the school where I was, at the Angeles school, we had all this equipment. We even had a Steadicam vest. And I tried to do Steadicam operating, and it was so hard and complicated. So I actually rotated. I think that I did everything but makeup, pretty much, uh, on all position. And every time I was learning something, working on a project in that position. And I learned how much, maybe I didn't like the position, but I knew and understand what they were doing. And... Very connected to this, I think that the other pitfall is not 
understanding actors and not or not uh, respecting actors enough. Mm-hmm. And I think that the best way is actually uh, uh, acting. Uh, and taking a course, yeah, taking an acting director, course. Yeah. An acting course and in some way also, you know, maybe you do an acting course and you learn a few things, a few tricks, uh, but the main goal is to learn how to appreciate the difficulties that they go through so that you can, you know, empathize and understand them. But I would say once in a while, put yourself again, maybe, you know, in a class of a friend that you know or something like that, um, uh, to to refresh your mind about the fear of, of the stage and being in front of the camera instead of behind. Because it's something that, you know, sometimes we, we think give for granted. But that moment uh, where everything is around you and you need to perform and you need to deliver because everything has been designed for you to do it. Uh, the weight of those moments is, and the pressure is incredible. And I think that uh, as a director, sometimes a little bit of a reminder every few years of that pressure could be very helpful. Now, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, well, today I think that we are in a very good uh, place, actually, with in respect to a few years ago. Um, I think that there are many more opportunities because there are many more screens that you need to fill up. So mm-hmm. there is a need for much more content. Uh, whether it's you know it's the classic film for theaters that is kind of a, a in a in a dire situation right now, or you know web material that you can watch on the on the phone. There are uh, more and more opportunities to produce your own content. And put it out there and find find an audience. Um, so I'd say um, it's very important for me to first of all be honest with yourself and see if this is a fire that you really you cannot put out that <laughs> is through passion. And the best way to test it for me is to figure out a way to be on a set, being a PA. Uh, if you if you survive a, a full production on a set as a PA then probably you have the stamina to do whatever whatever else is needed or mm-hmm. the passion that is needed. Um, so an experience on set, I think, is vital. And the other thing is to start working and shooting um, your own project. Uh, write scenes uh, or even a scene that you see in a movie that you like. Try to replicate it with your iPhone and some friends. Uh, the, the opportunity to shoot and to learn everything you can from that shooting is so valuable um, at, at any, any level of, of, uh, of production. So even just doing it by yourself, I think it's uh, it's vital. I think it's Werner Herzog that said, every time you're on set, you learn from every minute that you're spending there. Correct. Uh, and I think I think it's totally true. And you you can learn as a PA, but of course, when you direct your own things, from your mistakes, and also also by your successes, you learn much more about your strengths and what you can do to do better, to do better next time. Uh, and I, I started that way. I mean, I, I literally started with basically no knowledge of filmmaking, just reading a, a few books to understand, you know, crossing the line and, and yeah. a couple of other things. But, you know, my, my very first short was, uh, uh, you know, a, a consumer camera and me dancing in front of it for a specific reason that, that is better to share. But, um, that short was something that actually opened doors because um, it's uh, it's something that was done uh, with lots of passion and with a message that wanted to be expressed. It was very clear to me. And still today, it's something that uh, uh, held me out at the beginning with, again, no knowledge, technical knowledge, but the desire and the will to, to shoot whatever was happening. And then the technical knowledge kind of came later. Now, and what are three of your favorite films of all time? Um, I think that we go back to what what we mentioned before, Star Wars, because it was the first one, Dead Point Society, because it was the one that I, I watched at the right time, in a moment where I started to understand uh, that my quirkiness or, or my uh, uh, interest about you know filmmaking and writing weren't that crazy, but they were actually something that uh, could make sense. Uh, and later on, American Beauty, because it kind of came as a full circle after that point society, that point society tells you, seize the day. 
and uh, I I might have skipped that moment in in when I was in high school and, and college, and then American Beauty kind of taught me uh, it's never too late to seize the day. So when I had the chance later on, I, I grab it and and now I'm here. So that's why this is the my trilogy. Um, and similarly, where can people buy the book? Uh, the book is on Amazon right mm-hmm. now uh, and probably in some bookstores if they still exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, it can be bought on the MWP, uh, Michael Weasley Productions, the, the publishing company, uh, mwp.com. Uh, and uh, you can find it there also with other discounts and other materials. Simone, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been a pleasure talking to you, talking shop with a with a, f- a fellow director, and talking about the trials and tribulations of being a director. And hopefully, we have inspired and scared the hell out of some people uh, listening today. So, thank you, my friend, for being on the show. Thank you, much. thank you very much. It was great being here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.